G'day guys, Mac with The Outer Circle, and today we're going to talk about the rules editor job. And on top of that, I want to talk about what actually constitutes good rules in my opinion. Uh, this is always a subjective thing, but uh, let's get into it. So, the job. Are you the person, the one who can spot an incorrect stat or misleading comma in a rule at 50 paces? The one in your gaming group others always turn to when they have a particularly vexing rules situation no d6 role is ever going to resolve? Would you consider yourself an expert in any of the specialist design studios games? The Horus Heresy, Adeptus Titanicus, Blood Bowl, Middle Earth trademark, Aeronautica Imperialis, and Necromunda? If so, this is the job for you. First things first there. The problem with Games Workshop rules is not a comma in a wrong place or a slightly incorrect stat. The problem with Games Workshop rules is fundamental. There are huge discrepancies with how things are written. It's If only a comma is out of place, let's just say that's a good thing. What my problems are, are usually that they have huge misunderstandings of what they're trying to convey, and they miss the milestone by, well, a mile. Anyway, continuing on. We're looking for an excellent communicator with a high standard of English and an in-depth knowledge of specialist design studios games range. This is not a writing role, but you will be working directly with our team of in-house writers to develop as well as meticulously check and edit rules as they are created and prepared for publication. Your key responsibilities will include giving and receiving constructive feedback on rules text throughout its development and being clear and efficient when doing so, both in person and digitally via email, Google Docs, etc. Playtesting new and updated rules during their development to feedback on their quality, accuracy, clarity and interactivity with an existing rules. Working successfully and collaboratively and effectively with the writing, editorial, graphic design and translation teams to input and coordinate amendments to rules, text, during the various stages of its lifespan. Editing other materials that SDS, the Specialist Design Team, or Specialist Design? I think that's what it is. Specialist Design Studio. Huh? Producers, which are relevant to or include rules text, such as rules published in packaging, FAQs and other downloads, etc. Working with existing and establishing new systems to accurately track and manage rules data through a game's lifespan, including lexicons and rules text style guides for writers and other editors to use. You will have excellent organizational skills and the ability to juggle multiple priorities and projects simultaneously. A proactive and pragmatic nature with a keen eye for problem solving. Great team working skills. A lack of bias towards your favorite army slash model, etc. Experience playing tabletops war games. Broad knowledge of Games Workshop's brands, settings, and products. Does that include candles? Uh, working at Games Workshop. Let's ignore that. Um, I don't need to know what the benefits are. I really don't. Let's take a few steps back. So, excellent communicator with a high standard of English and in-depth knowledge of Specialist Design Studios and Games Range. Well, I fit your criteria. Uh, I think my communication skills are pretty on point. Uh, 16.7 thousand subscribers at this point, I think, agree. But anyway giving and receiving constructive feedback on rules text throughout its development and being clear and efficient when doing so, both in person and digitally via email, Google Docs, etc. I have been giving feedback, and this is not just me. I mean people have been giving feedback to Games Workshop and Forge World for a very long time. Now, ignore it when the feedback comes from just random people. I, I get that. I get ignoring that. But when you have large sectors of the community with, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of subscribers come to you and they say, this thing's a bit broken. And another community that also has tens or hundreds of thousands of subscribers turns around and says, we think this is a bit broken. Instead of ignoring them, okay, perhaps listen to them. So a great example of this was when Radio Free Istvan, the podcast out of the USA, who used to do a huge heresy podcast, uh, they actually organized and sent a cake to Nottingham. They had printed onto the cake a FAQ for the Horace Heresy. This was because the Horace Heresy had gone years without actually getting an FAQ. Apparently, they got the cake, 
we know they got the cake because they tracked the cake through the cake handling app. Pretty funny that they have an app for tracking a cake, but it's a thing. This cake got to Nottingham, the team got a hold of it, and then they failed to correctly implement the FAQ or even take all these suggestions within it on board. In fact, the FAQ we got was pretty terrible. And they updated it by adding a few extra lines a few years after that, uh, which still didn't fix the problem. And so you have a situation where we have a Horus Heresy FAQ for the Age of Darkness, which was last updated in 2019. February of 2019, in fact. And as you would all know, we are currently in December of 2021. So we're closing in on three years since they FAQ'd the game. Now, do we think anything might have happened in that last three years that might be relevant? Well, a little bit. We got a small errata for Book 9, I guess, but they didn't go back and revisit any of the so-called trial rules in this book. And this is the point where I'll give you an example of just one, just one example of the FAQ that's supposed to fix things. FAQ and errata are supposed to fix things in the game going wrong. Graviton weapons. So the Graviton Imploder was a very strong weapon in the Horus Heresy, capable of completely annihilating units if you had a squad of them, usually on, um, uh, what are they, the Mechanicum guys, the Auto Reductor Boys, Myrmidons, yes, Myrmidons, that's the one. And the Graviton Imploder was something like, I think it was Fleshbane, so it was like twos to wound at AP2. So quite a strong weapon, and the unit was, I think, Ballistic Skill 5, and it was possible to give them Preferred Enemy uh, by attaching the appropriate HQ to them. So very strong combination. Cool. But the weapon as described is meant to be a anti-armor weapon. So what have we got? Range 18, Strength, Star. AP is still 2. It's a Salvo 2-4 weapon. It's concussive and has Graviton Implosion. So Salvo 2-4 means if you move... You can only fire two shots unless you're relentless. Otherwise, you get four shots if you stay still. Concussive. If it does manage to wound a model that has multiple wounds, that model counts as initiative one for the rest of the turn. Okay. Graviton implosion. Models which are hit by this weapon must roll equal to or under their strength or suffer one wound. Well, the average toughness in Horus Heresy is four. Therefore, you're needing to roll a 1, 2, 3, or 4. So 66% of people aren't even going to take a wound from this, let alone have to make a save. That's not very strong. It has no ignores cover mechanic either, so you're praying for units that are out in the open. Not a great start. Uh, then you have the 3d6 armor penetration. Well, the average roll on 3d6, the average high roll, it's 11. The average low roll is 10. That's not good odds, because armor in the Horus Heresy is average value 13. So this weapon, it's not really going to cut the mustard, because the sort of units you want to shoot with AP2 is things like Terminators. Well, they're, you're going to need a 5 to wound, basically. It's essentially a strength 3 weapon against them. And um, you better hope they're not a higher toughness unit as well. There are things like Black Shields Terminators, which can be toughness 5, where you're fishing for a 1 in 6 chance to wound them. Uh, also, your weapon's 18 inches, so you're getting very close to that unit of Terminators, by the way, uh, with your very expensive Myrmidon unit. It doesn't matter if it can kill, you know, Militia very easily. Well, what can't kill Militia? Bolt guns kill Militia very efficiently, don't they? So, not very great. So, the weapon has completely failed in its goal. And this is an FAQ trying to fix it. And like I said, you know, 3D6 is for arm penetration. You're going to glance a rhino on the front. That's about it. That's not good odds. But, you know, throw enough dice at it. And yeah, you, you might roll a triple six in there. And, you know, go straight through the front of a land raider, I guess. You know, it's something. But anyway, back to the rules editor roll. Playtesting new and updated rules during the development to feedback on their quality, accuracy, clarity, and interactivity with existing rules. This is a single staff member. So call me cynical, but how does a single staff member provide uh, playtesting for the Horus Heresy, Adeptus Titanicus, Blood Bowl, Middle Earth, trademark, Aeronautica Imperialis, and Necromunda? 
I mean, for Horus Heresy alone, you have 18 legions, shattered legions, and black shields. The shattered legions, let me just um, do a quick bit of math here. Uh, so to figure out the amount of possible combinations with shattered legions, you can take up to three HQs, which means you can take up to three different legions. Uh, so to figure out the, the max amount of possible combinations without duplicating a legion, it's very simple maths. It's 18 by 17 by 16, which is 4,896 possible combinations of shattered legions. And you're telling me that someone is going to play test that, and they're also going to have time to do Blood Bowl, Middle Earth, Aeronautica, Imperialis, Necromunda. How many houses are there in Necromunda? And how do you really playtest something and assess the abilities of it without playing through the campaign to see how uh, miniatures will accrue experience over time and how these skills and stat line of the models improve and break the game? You won't be able to test the multitude of ways in which that happens. And this is the problem. You can't have a specialist design team who looks after multiple game systems and expect them to give the appropriate amount of consideration to each game system. It will not happen. That is why we have so few releases for all of these myriad of systems. Because they're spending a week on this one, then a week on that one, then a week on this one, and a week on that one. And once they finish putting it out, they're getting pulled off it to go and work on the next thing. It's a shit fight. So, moving back down, working successfully collaboratively and effectively within the writing, editorial, graphical design, and translation teams to input and coordinate amendments to rules, text during the variation stages of its lifespan. So, how can you, again, for the sake of cynicism here, how can you say that you're out there testing out various combinations, uh, the quality, the accuracy, the clarity, uh, play testing them, and also have time to work with the graphic design team or the editorial team or translation team in order to fully integrate what you're working on. You can't be doing all of those things at once, at least not to, you know, uh, 100% of your abilities. Editing other materials that uh, Specialist Design Studios produces, which are relevant to or include rules text, such as rules published in packaging, FAQs, other downloads, etc. Well, again, uh, if you're editing those things, how can you be paying the appropriate amount of attention to these other things? One person can only be stretched so far. And working with existing and establishing new systems to accurately track and manage rules data throughout a game's lifespan, including lexicons and rules text style guides for writers and other editors to use. Well, how does one do that? That, in and of itself, you, you're talking about massive amounts of data tracking. It would take months just to develop the system. Uh, you'd you'd start small scale, obviously, and then um, sort of work it up to cover multiple game systems. So once you get a system in place, you can apply it across multiple things. But what data are you trying to catch there? Okay, now I'm just a simple man, but as an example, um, I these days run a plastic factory. Uh, in fact, the only people above me now in the company are the CEO, uh, the managing directors and the board of directors, so I'm relatively high up in the system. So I understand a lot of what goes into running a factory. So some of the things uh, data-wise that I might capture, okay, and I know this is irrelevant to capturing this data, but it gives people an idea of what sort of data you might capture, is if I'm making a part and I need to price the part, I need to know the injection time, the cooling time, the overall cycle time, the amount of material used, the amount of waste material used, the amount of staff required to pick the materials, pack the materials, uh, the amount of staff who are involved in the process of getting those materials in place. All of this has a flow on effect. These are all things you need to think about as data. So what would be, keeping in mind, that is a minimum amount of data for pricing apart, what would be more data that I need? Well. If I was the guy who was working on rules, it might be useful to know what the stats are on a unit. How often are people taking it in their force? What are the points? What are the points versus the stats? I mean, do you start with a datum point? Do you have a baseline of points that you apply to every unit that's, let's say, a Space Marine stat? And then every time you modify that, you either add or subtract points from that. Well, that's a great way to do a 
uh, an initial balance or a starting balance. But how do you quantify that over the life of the unit, over the role it fulfills in a force or chart? Do you say because something's an elite and therefore less accessible, you give it a points cut? Or do you say, oh, well, you know, this one rule I'm giving it is actually a really strong special rule, therefore I have to make extra points for it. You see, there's a huge amount of data you've got to capture when you're looking at the system. And again, how can you be capturing all that data and be capturing it for what? one, two, three, four, five, six whole specialist game systems and be playtesting them and be editing them and be helping out the graphical design team and be also uh, incorporating those new rules into other languages. Uh, how can you be running a fine tooth comb over it and checking out that, uh, what was it again? Uh, 4,896 uh, possible combinations of Shattered Legions alone. Yeah, that's not going to happen. As for the skills you will have, not you should have, you will have excellent organizational skills, the ability to juggle multiple priorities and projects simultaneously. Well, again, it's going to be very hard to keep your head in the zone with one game system, such as Horus Heresy, when at the same time you spend a week playtesting Aeronautica Imperialis. It's going to be very hard to you know get your head around that. And if you're playing a system like... Uh, Titanicus, because it's going to use a lot of the same names and terms as another system, you might find yourself getting confused. So I feel sorry for the very poor person who takes this on. Uh, you're going to have a proactive and pragmatic uh, nature with a keen eye for problem solving. So you want an engineer. <laughs> uh, proactive, you want to go out, you want to seek out the problems and, well, pragmatic nature that's an interesting choice of words because is that you go out you find the problem then you say well actually that's going to be really hard to fix therefore i don't think the investment of my time and skills into doing that will yield enough of a return to justify it i'm not sure that that's uh what this person would be hired for great team working skills yep yeah, well you, you're a team on your own who's going to be working with a lot of departments so that's going to be a, a challenge uh you must have a lack of bias towards your favorite army model, etc. That's a difficult one, um, but I think an analytical person could definitely overcome it. Experience playing tabletop war games? Well, if you don't have that, yeah, you shouldn't be in this job, so that is a you will have. Uh, and broad knowledge of Games Workshop brands, settings, and products. Yes, um, to a degree, that's very true. But uh, this is also with an eye on that lack of bias. This is where also having only a middling level of knowledge might actually be a benefit potentially because you'll have less uh, inherent bias in a person if they're given a broad outline of what's required um, and they're not told exactly what a unit's you know name is or who they belong to, you might be able to do more with it. So there's a lot of leeway you have there. Anyway, enough about this stuff. Let's talk about a unit with good rules and what makes them good rules. The White Scars Legion Golden Kashyyyk Jet Bike. So I recently did a video on the Grey Knights and how they broke 5th edition. And I spoke a lot about what I considered bad rules in there. So for those who are wondering what they are, in order to reduce the length of this video, go over there and you'll see a number of units and abilities uh, for very cheap points and you understand how all those things combined make an overpowered force. Well, this is how you make a strong unit, but it's not overpowered. So the Golden Kashyyyk, you get three models and they cost 160 points base. It's 40 points for each additional model and you can max out the unit at six models. So you're going to be looking at around the 280 points for six. They come with Artificer Armor, but thanks to, again, good rules writing, they won't actually benefit from it because they're on jet bikes and jet bikes have a 2 plus armor save anyway. So it's a pointless rule. Um, there you go. Hire me for your rules department games workshop. Anyway, the bikes they come with are Shamshir jet bikes, which have scatterbolt launchers. So imagine heavy flamer stats, strength 5, AP 4, a flamer template coming from the front of the bike because it fires a big shotgun. The whole squad can have melter bombs for plus 25 points for the whole unit, uh, which is an interesting choice because the melter bombs are very strong, 
but also the unit has a specialist weapon which might be better against vehicles depending on the situation and the toughness of the vehicle. They all can take power weapons for 10 points a model. They can take a thunder hammer for 20 points on the champion. Now, keep in mind, this unit is a basic marine stat line. One attack, leadership eight. The only difference is their weapon skill 5, and because they're on a bike, they become toughness 5. So, not a hugely strong elite unit. A lot of elite units would have 2, 3 attacks base, they'll be weapon skill 5, maybe ballistic skill 5, they could have initiative 5. Leadership, 8 is very low for an elite legion unit. A lot of elite legion units are 10. So, uh, what else have they got going for them? Uh, well, they have the hit and run special rule. And because they're white scars, they're going to have skilled rider because they're on a bike. Uh, thanks to the born in the saddle rule. And of course, thanks to being white scars, they have the swift action special rule. Which is if they move their full distance, uh, which would be 12 in the case of a jet bike, and they move towards an enemy unit. In the movement phase, they can re-roll failed to wound rolls of a 1 for all attacks until the beginning of your next turn. Which is pretty handy. So the main weapon, obviously, as you can see from the picture, is the Contos Power Lance. So when you actually charge with this model, you strike an initiative of 10, Strength 7, AP 2, and you have the Sunder Rule, so you're getting that, you know, chance for a better armor penetration. You're also going to have Murderous Strike, so any 6s to wound are instant death. And Concussive. So for some reason, you can stun people by sticking a spear through their head, I guess. But that's on the charge. If you don't charge, it's only the user's strength and it's AP4. So mm, not terrible, but not great. But the interesting thing is when you use the spear, you don't get any bonuses from your pistol or close combat weapon. You only get a single attack with it. So here you have a unit that's not particularly tough. They're no faster than any other jet bike. But if they do pull off the charge, that six attacks they hit with is going to hit like a freight train because it's going to be hitting anything that's not an elite unit. It's going to hit on a three. An elite unit, it's going to hit on a four. It's going to wound most things on a two, except for something like monstrous creatures. Most units are not going to get a save against it. And those monstrous creatures that do take a wound from it, they're going to be knocked down to initiative one for the next turn. And because of their ability to hit and run, they've got a pretty good chance of being able to jump out there, especially against an initiative one concussed unit. So all in all, this is how you ride a unit. Very much White Scar's play style. It's fast, it hits hard, but with one wound, a two up save, toughness five, no invulnerable, no additional bonuses to things like jinking, this unit will suffer hard if it is attacked. And at 280 points for 6, it's not cheap, but it's not super expensive either. It'll probably struggle to make back its points, but a good charge at the right time on the right unit will be worth it. So that's how you do good rules riding. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Feel free to disagree with me in the comments below. I'm back with the Outer Circle. Please let me know what you think. Would you apply for the Rules Editor, especially if you have applied for it? Let me know. Because I'm very curious to see what people have, uh, if they've really taken into account just how many things they're being asked to work on simultaneously here and how I highly doubt that anyone but the most motivated micromanager who spends all of their time at work is actually going to be able to tackle them all. I can definitely see them being able to improve some rules across the system, uh, at least the glaring, most obvious ones, yes. But when you're producing an errata every three years for the system currently, we're not exactly setting a high bar there, are we? Especially when the errata is loaded with mistakes anyway that don't fix problems. But that's just my thoughts. Let me know yours. Mac with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all on the next one.